Hi everyone, my name is Sean. I'm super excited to be here on behalf of uh, MXNet community. And I'm here to tell you all about MXNet 2.0 and our role in addressing the fragmentation problem in deep learning and machine learning frameworks. A bit about myself, um, I'm a senior applied scientist at uh, Amazon AI, and I'm also a PPMC member of um, Apache MXNet. Uh, I was a steering committee member of um, Onyx, which is a deep learning model exchange standard. And I participate in the consortium for Python API standards on behalf of these two projects. In today's talk, we'll first look at um, the current state of AI frameworks and examine the fragmentation problem. Afterwards, I'll introduce how MX 2.0 will help bridge the gap caused by the fragmentation and then I'll share an update on the ecosystem and the community of MXNet. First, let's take a look at the rich and the diverse AI frameworks and the fragmentation problem that's hidden in them. Here is an AI open source landscape that is uh, curated by Linux AI and Data Foundation. AI is among the fastest growing field that spreads into every industry. The demand for AI talents almost doubles every year since 2015. And similarly, there is an explosion in the diversity of AI tools that touches every aspect of modern day uh, AI in data processing, in data analysis and modeling. Because of the high practical value and even higher potential, the industry invests a lot in the AI tooling. You may recognize the logos of many of the popular AI tools here. Um, so such a diverse offering in AI open source software means that uh, whatever new AI projects someone wants to start with, um, chances are it's almost guaranteed that one can find a solution among so many options. On the other hand, this means significant fragmentation in open source AI software. Most notably in the circle at the top, deep learning software is evolved to become a whole independent group from the earlier machine learning tools, despite that uh, conceptually deep learning is a new way of modeling in machine learning. The diversity of options and fragmentations are like the two sides of a coin, and they go hand in hand. Let's take a closer look at how this landscape came to be. First, there are notable differences between the design choices of deep learning and the traditional machine learning frameworks. For example, deep learning frameworks usually don't offer data frames, and uh, deep learning frameworks have higher tolerance for low precision calculation, just because um, uh, it has a higher need for scaling, and uh, the algorithms are also more tolerant of low precision. Um, also, in deep learning frameworks, the optimization usually don't focus on scalar programs, and uh, automatic differentiation is also a uh, distinct characteristic of um, deep learning frameworks. Um, and finally, a few of the um, optimization techniques and hardwares um, first came out in deep learning because of the needs for scaling. Um, so these are quite major differences in design choices and what this tells us is that um, the many frameworks came out uh, as uh, different libraries out of necessity. Secondly, frameworks also have different design choices in terms of programming paradigms. Historically, MXNet provides two programming paradigms. They're the imperative programming and the symbolic programming. So let me give an example to explain what they are. Um, one of the most well-known array library that provides imperative programming is NumPy. So here I have a NumPy program. So uh, first I created two arrays, A and B, each of which are um, a bunch of ones. Um, and then on B, I multiplied that by two. Um, I further multiplied the results of uh, B with uh, A to get the array C. I printed C and then uh, I added one on top of C. So as you can see, um, I can print the intermediate results anywhere I need. It's very easy to debug and it's very easy to uh, code.
Now, in order to explain why on earth we would want any other programming paradigm, I need to explain how we can improve this program further. Um, in the diagram on the right, um, I described the computation flow of this program. We have variable a and b that are multiplied together, um, and then there's the add one uh, that's um, the output of uh, variable d. So if we create a symbolic graph that represents this calculation um, and pass it on to a compiler, what this compiler can tell us is that uh, in this program, the variable D can actually share the memory with uh, variable C. This kind of analysis and automatic memory optimization is only possible if we give up the explicit control on memory allocation that is uh, needed in imperative programs. Now, such optimization may not be perfect, uh, especially as the program gets uh, more complex. And also, um, some users might be, ex especially experienced users, might be very good at uh, identifying such optimization so that they would prefer to do it manually. So this kind of uh, difference in programming paradigm um, depends on um, the scenario um, on uh, where they're suitable, and also uh, depends on the taste of uh, the user um, on these paradigms. So uh, different users might make different choices in um, applying these paradigms. So, so far we've seen uh, different design choices out of necessity and uh, out of uh, providing more options to the users. But in terms of different design choices, there are also cases where the differences are not meaningfully necessary. So here's an example. Uh, in this table, we summarized the available interfaces in the six frameworks at the top um, that uh, implement some NumPy operations that are listed on the left. The frameworks are CoolPy, Dask, uh, JAX, MXNet, PyTorch, and uh, TensorFlow. As you can see from the table, some operations um, actually have um, uh, very consistent uh, function naming across the frameworks. Um, however, for some functions like true divide, there are some minor name differences in, say, TensorFlow. So such variations are largely due to historical reasons rather than any necessary design choices. Um, they are what causes uh, the unnecessary learning curves to the users who are already familiar with uh, some of the array libraries. In the context of machine learning and deep learning open source software, by fragmentation, I'm referring to these two problems. It's the lack of interoperability and uh, the lack of common interface design. Next, I'll try to convince you that this is very costly. To understand the cost of fragmentation, let's examine it from the perspectives of both users and developers. To the users of a framework, fragmentation among frameworks creates lock-in in two ways. First, the lack of a common interface design locks the user in to the framework by requiring the users to learn to use it, uh, and that is a skill that's not transferable. When switching frameworks, users must relearn APIs and best practices. Second, the lack of interoperability means that uh, the code base a user develops on top of a framework is not usable elsewhere. Users must rewrite the code to migrate to another framework. This locking makes it hard to benefit from the strengths of different frameworks by the users. To the third-party developers who develop hardware, runtime, or other third-party extensions to enhance frameworks. These people must invest in integrating each of the frameworks they want to support, which results in duplicated investments and higher engineering costs. This hinders progress and creates a barrier for innovation. Framework agnostic extensions often suffer from maintainability issues, such as managing uh, complex dependencies because of the different frameworks. So I hope by now I've convinced you that uh, framework fragmentation costs everyone. 
The key to address the fragmentation problem is to standardize and build a consensus. Here I introduce the two standardization efforts in machine learning and deep learning that I'm honored to participate in. They're the Consortium for Python Data API Standards and the Open Neural Network Exchange. Open Neural Network Exchange, or ONIX, is uh, another standard model exchange format for deep learning that is started in the industry. ONIX facilitates the exchange of deep learning models, and it does so by providing a definition of an extensible computation graph model, as well as the definitions of built-in operators and the standard data types. The Consortium for Python Data API Standards aims to address the fragmentation problem in machine learning and deep learning frameworks and create synergy by developing API standards for arrays and data frames. Besides MXNet and Onyx, the consortium consists of key contributors in many of the major frameworks, including members from NumPy, CoolPy, TensorFlow, PyTorch, JAX, X-Array, and Dask communities. We work together by examining the current API definitions in these frameworks and carefully design the future-proof APIs. Once we discuss and agree on a design, the proposed standards are then shared to the public as requests for comments, or RFCs, that um, uh, the library maintainers can provide feedbacks early on and adopt afterwards. The community participates in reviews throughout this process. Recently, we released the first draft of the Array API standard, the scope focuses on the core functionality of an array library, as you can see at the bottom. We intentionally left out items that are not common or cannot be fully specified to be out of scope. This is to make sure that we can focus on a scope that we can agree on and ensure adoption as a community. Later on, there will be ad additional optional extensions that we may include later, such as uh, neural network operations. Here, I'd like to talk more on what we explicitly chose to leave out of scope or define as uh, non-goals. Um, there are conscious decisions we make as a group to avoid sacrificing the diversity in the libraries um, in the process of st standardization. Um, and also, we want to preserve the user options and the strengths of different frameworks. So, for example, we avoid standardization on anything related to implementation or execution semantics, such as uh, whether it's um, a serial uh, synchronous program or asynchronous parallel programs. Um, this is because they are largely defined by the framework developers with uh, very different design philosophies, and they don't necessarily affect the user interfaces. Um, also, um, our goal is not to uh, make the libraries identical so that they can be merged. We definitely don't want that to happen. Um, and um, um, it's also not our goal to have a runtime system to switch from uh, one array to another. Um, also, because um, one library don't, uh, doesn't necessarily have knowledge about another library, we're not making it a goal to uh, possibly mix the different array libraries inside the same program. One feature I'd like to highlight in the standard is the data interchange protocol called DLPack. This protocol enables data exchange for data on different devices, including GPUs and accelerators. It allows asynchronous data exchange with a zero copy where possible. The two parts in this protocol are the consumer interface and the provider interface below. So the consumer interface will call the provider interface inside its implementation to express the need for exchanging data, potentially on a CUDA stream that's specified in the function call. This allows the exchange to happen without synchronization if possible, and it can be very helpful for performance. So overall, this solution enables different libraries that implement these interfaces to be used together for different parts of a program. And uh, overall, the program can run asynchronously without any blocking. 
The DL Pack library is a header-only library designed to be minimal, and it's focused on data exchange. It consists of um, these four types and has extensible support for devices and data types. It also guarantees a stable ABI to make sure that libraries on different versions of DL Pack can still exchange data without problems. Now that we have a good understanding of the fragmentation problems and the solutions, let's look at what we are building in MXNet 2.0 to help with the fragmentation problem. First, to those who are not familiar with the MXNet, Apache MXNet is a truly open source, vendor neutral deep learning framework that is developed in the Apache Software Foundation. It's uh, also a community of uh, deep learning enthusiasts with the common goal of democratizing AI. It's also developed to be flexible and efficient and ready for production. And finally, it adopts both the Python Data API Consortium standard as well as the uh, Onyx uh, that I mentioned before. In MXNet 2.0, we aim to provide a bridge between NumPy-based machine learning and the deep learning. The two most notable features are the NumPy compatible programming and the Gluon 2.0. The NumPy compatible programming consists of two interfaces, NP and NPX. NP is a NumPy compatible array library with uh, the enhancement of automatic differentiation and the GPU acceleration. It will also be compliant with the Python array API standard. NPX is a neural network extension to the NumPy compatible array API. And uh, to make the programming easier and more efficient, Gluon 2.0 provides high level programming API for optimized deep learning. Gluon 2.0 provides a natural programming experience. The Gluon interface offers high level abstraction to help users structure their model programs. In this example, we have a simple network for image classification. The parameters are declared in the constructor, and uh, the forward function expresses the computation for model inference. Users can, ex can mix the use of uh, NumPy operations from the drop-in replacement of NumPy uh, using mx.mp and uh, neural network operations from mx.mpx. The whole definition takes just a few lines of code. With that uh, model definition, Gluon's JIT, which we call hybridization, can serialize and uh, optimize the, the program and uh, export um, NumPy and the neural network models uh, to the different bindings of um, uh, other programming languages, or to deploy the models through TBM, TensorRT, OpenVINO, or to uh, all other operating systems. It can also be exported to um, the Onyx model exchange format. This makes the um, Gluon models extremely portable. Also, MXNet 2.0 is designed to be highly customizable. Uh, we offer custom C++ operator support, TVM operator support, and even custom backends. So here, uh, with the custom C++ operator support, there's no longer a need for maintaining a fork of uh, MXNet just because um, some operations are custom um, and uh, we used to require to compile that um, uh, operation alongside the MXNet code. So instead, you can now use a new custom operator interface to define the custom operation and uh, compile that as a, a completely separate library, then load it at runtime. And we also support um, um, using TVM to write operators in MXNet. TVM is the new top-level Apache project that is a deep learning compiler. Um, it's aimed at um, automatically optimizing the deep learning programs efficiently. So in the example on the right-hand side, um, you can see the length of programs uh, that are implementing um, the, the same operation in the Python interface in TVM and in C++ implementing it manually. 
you can see that um, the program in TVM is a lot more concise and that program can be automatically optimized by the compiler. So this makes developing very efficient. And finally, MXNet even supports custom backends. So the way we support it is that um, in MXNet, we have the concept of um, uh, computation graphs, as I explained before. And um, uh, in our backend, we have a way to uh, partition that graph so that um, a part of it can be dispatched to some custom backends. So in the diagram on the right, we see an example of partitioning the convolution and batch norm operators as a subgraph um, so that they can be um, merged and fused together to become a convolution plus batch norm uh, kind of fused operator. Um, but that operator can also be dispatched to uh, some other custom backends or even custom hardware. So this makes MXNet support for custom hardware highly versatile. As a deep learning framework, MXNet is well known for its high performance. In the recent uh, MLPerf 1.0 uh, training benchmark, MXNet is actually used in 30 out of the 67 submissions for the on-premise available solutions. So in the table on the right, uh, we see all such submissions and uh, the MXNet ones are highlighted in green. Um, and also, most notably, uh, NVIDIA sets uh, a few new records with MXNet. Um, so for ResNet 50, SSD, and the UNet 3D, um, the, the MX, MXNet submissions by NVIDIA actually broke the speed record um, on the best results. Also, MXNet is highly optimized for inference performance with the help of um, Intel 1DNN. So here we see a, a benchmark of um, the latest 2.0 alpha version, um, um, Intel Xeon Platinum 8380 CPUs. So for MobileNet, we see a speed up of um, over 500 times compared to a naive version without 1DNN. And also for ResNet 50, we see um, over 800 times speed up um, compared to a naive implementation uh, without 1DNN. With that, next I'd like to share an update about uh, our community and also introduce our ecosystem to those who are new to MXNet. MXNet is a large community. So far, it has uh, over 960 contributors. Uh, it's close to 20K uh, stars. Uh, there's, there are almost 7,000 forks. And um, in Apache, we've uh, made progress with uh, uh, over 6,000 commits. Um, so it's uh, already widely adopted and trusted in the uh, industry and academia alike. For those who are interested in getting involved in MXNet, there are a few ways to stay connected. Uh, first, we have uh, an active dev list for technical discussion and also for decision making. Um, and we also use uh, the ASF Slack. Uh, we have uh, an MXNet channel there uh, where we have active discussions too. Um, and also for those who want to get uh, started for um, contribution, um, you could uh, look for our fir good first issues. Um, they're uh, the ones that are simple enough to help newcomers to get started on uh, contributing to MXNet. So by helping us, you would learn how uh, you could make a contribution to MXNet in that process. Uh, for those who are uh, well-seasoned uh, Apache members, um, you could also look for our roadmap. Um, so currently we have uh, active development on uh, making uh, MXNet or API standard compatible. And also we're looking into uh, deep learning compiler integration. And uh, finally, for news and updates, uh, we have a social media presence on Twitter, on Medium, on YouTube, and uh, LinkedIn. 
and you can find the logins um, the uh, right hand side um, next I'd like to talk about um, our ecosystems and share our great offerings there first I'd like to introduce autogluon autogluon is an auto ml tool that enables automatic machine learning with just three lines of code it automatically ensembles various models and performs hyperparameter optimization as shown in the table so on 11 Kaggle competitions and compared to other AutoML tools, AutoGluon performs the best on seven of them with the least time spent. Dive into Deep Learning or D2L is a deep learning book with the perfect combination of knowledge and hands-on practice. It is written as Jupyter Notebooks to help build a solid foundation in deep learning. And combined with an active community of learners that help each other, D2L is the best deep learning book out there. And Jensen Huang, the CEO of NVIDIA, also highly recommends it. And next in computer vision, uh, Gluon CV is a versatile deep learning for a computer vision toolkit that provides training and deployment for a wide range of tasks, including image classification, detection, segmentation, action recognition, and post-estimation. And another great CV toolkit I'd like to highlight is uh, Insight Face. It's a deep learning toolkit for face analysis. It provides implementations and pre-trained SOTA models. And uh, the two killer features in uh, Deep Insight are ArcFace, the model for face recognition, and the award-winning Retina Face model, which is for uh, face localization. Insight Face is a famous and widely used toolkit in both academia and the industry. It aims to become the center for innovation in deep face analysis. In NLP, Gluon LP provides training and deployment for a wide variety of natural language tasks, such as translation, text classification, natural language inference, and text generation. It offers over a thousand pre-trained models and low-cost training and deployment. In the next major version, Gluon LP provides the NumPy-based uh, implementation and also more backbone networks and data processing tools. Gluon LP focuses on the industry and powers many of the AWS NLP services as well as Alexa natural language understanding. And another great NLP toolkit is Sokai 2.0. It's a sequence-to-sequence -sequence toolkit that specializes in translation. It provides state-of-the-art translation models and powers Amazon Translate. In the latest version, it adopts the Gluon interface that is implemented more concisely while improving the performance. It also integrates with many of the performance improvement techniques, such as uh, AMP and Horrorbot, and uh, it now achieves uh, about 3.4 times faster translation with quantized multi matrix multiplication. And for time series analysis, Gluon TS is a deep learning for time series toolkit that powers Amazon Forecast. It's designed to be modular and scalable with the production stability. You can mix different modules of uh, distributions probabilistic uh, components, neural network structures, and uh, different approaches uh, for uh, time series modeling. And uh, last but not least, Deep Graph Library, or DGL, is a flexible graph neural network toolkit. It is widely adopted in the research community and uh, has very high performance. It also offers domain-specific tools for knowledge graph embedding and life science in chemistry and biology. And with that, I thank you for listening.